Christian Church, we are so glad that you're here today, glad that we can have this day of worship. God is so good, isn't he? And we are so thankful for our Lord Jesus Christ, and boy, that's all right to clap for that, isn't it? It sure is. Hey, listen, in your bulletin today, would you take it right now, and in your bulletin is a little card that looks like this. This is our communication card. There in front of you uh, on your chairs is a pen. You can take that pen, fill out this communication card if you would, please. Just fill it out, put your name, address, telephone number on there, email if you have one. Love to communicate with you what's happening here at New Hope, a lot of stuff happening. We want you to be a part of all the events that we have here at New Hope. If you have prayer requests, please put those prayer requests on this card. Every week we get those prayer requests, and every week we pray for those particular requests. So be sure to fill that out and uh, turn that card uh, uh, into your uh, in the offering today, if you would. Now, also in your bulletin, you've got a little piece of paper like this. I've already heard reports of you handing these out. Oh, my goodness, I mean, at the uh, Shark's Tooth Festival. I mean, and it wasn't the police who told me. All right, I just want to tell you that. Thank you so much for all your work. Pray, continue to pray about this event. We're praying for kids to come to this event, for us to be able to reach out to those kids. This is a wonderful outreach opportunity uh, that will be this coming Saturday, this coming Saturday from 4.30 to 6 p.m. Now, also in your bulletin today is this little piece of paper. More volunteers needed. So many of you volunteered last week. Thank you for that. Uh, but we still need a few more volunteers in these particular areas. If you could volunteer, fill this out, put your name on it, just stick it in the offering today, and then uh, we'll be able to get in touch with you about, about that uh, particular ministry. Also in your bulletin today are a couple cards that look like this for Easter, next Sunday's Easter, most important uh, day of the year for the Christian. So many people are going to be going to church next Sunday. You take the opportunity to invite them to New Hope, would you? And these cards are for you to take and just give out to somebody, a friend next door, or somebody at work, or whatever. I've got a couple guys I'm going to have lunch with this week. I'm going to give them these cards and invite them to church next Sunday. We want them to come to New Hope. We want the opportunity to reach out to these folks. So take that, if you would, and share it uh, with the people that you know. Well, God is so good, and we're so thankful that we can gather and we can worship him would you join me as we pray together lord god how we thank you for this day of worship on this day that we mark as uh, as palm sunday this is the day where we think of people giving you worship and giving you praise in this day we give you that worship and we give you that praise we lift our hearts before you we commit to you in Jesus' name. We thank you so much for the opportunity that we have as a church to do these outreach events and to reach out to kids and to youth to make a difference in their lives, Lord. Thank you for all the workers, for their commitment. Thank you for a congregation that says, you know, I, I'm going to help. I'm going to do my part. Whatever it is, I'm going to do it. I'll be there. And thank you for that, Lord. We pray that you would work in the hearts of families that we don't even know, that they would come here uh, this Saturday for this event. And, Father, we would be able, they would see something that would make a difference. They might even want to come to church here, Lord. We, we'd love to have them here, have the opportunity to share your message with them. You bless us so much. We give you thanks and we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. As computer.
I'd like to open reading a little from Luke twenty two fourteen. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired thee this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and says, Take and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. As I was preparing for today, I tried to think, what could I possibly say that was new about these words? With a little prayer, I come to the conclusion there's absolutely nothing that I can say that is new about these words. There have been millions and millions of far, far more skilled and knowledgeable people than I that have covered the subject. What did occur to me is the permanence of these words. Two millennia ago, our brothers and sisters, either in blood or in faith, sat before Jesus Christ and listened to the Son of God's words. Here we are 70 generations later, and we read these same words and use them to praise Him. The words of Jesus Christ do not change. They're not subject to rewrite, revision, reinterpretation, fads, or trends. His words of salvation, redemption, and promise are for everlasting life are true and forever. And in this fact, we can take great solace. Let us remember this and honor him as we pray. Lord God, today we gather to give thanks to you for the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ, who faced betrayal, denial, and crucifixion on the cross, that we might have an opportunity to one day set in your realm. It is his name we pray. Amen. I'd like to relate a couple little stories about selfless giving. In Luke chapter 21, uh, as Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. Truly, I tell you, he said, this poor widow has put, more in, put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had to live on. Jesus recognized the love, the faith, faith and the trust in the Lord that this poor widow had. And with these words, he has forever immortalized her gift and her in the Bible. The second thing is Jesus and his disciples were supported on their mission by ordinary people who provided them food, shelter, and the other essentials of life. Most of these people were poor, yet they asked nothing in return, and they gave freely of what little that they had. I can think of no better examples to follow for our giving than for these. So if we present our tithes, gifts, and offerings, let's remember to, to do what we can, but do it with generosity, and that even small gifts, when given in the right heart, can have immense consequences. So let us pray. Father, today we come to you in prayer, asking your blessing on these tithes, gifts, and offerings, and for our brothers and sisters who have faithfully provided them. We also ask your guidance and wisdom that we use them to spread your word in this church, our community, and in the world. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Well, Mom decided to cook pancakes for breakfast one morning. She had two sons. One was age five and one was age three. As soon as they heard that she was cooking pancakes, one said to the other, and they began to argue, I want the first pancake, I want the first pancake. And finally, Mom said, you know, boys, if Jesus was here, he'd say to you, you ought to give your brother the first pancake. 
At that, the five-year-old turned to the three-year-old and said, Buddy, today you're playing Jesus. (laughs) When we get to Luke, the 23rd chapter, nobody wanted to be Jesus. Nobody. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The twin verse for that particular scripture is found in 1 John, the third chapter, verse 16, which says this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Today we consider the cross of Jesus Christ and I simply want to remind you and I want you to remember it forever that a theology without the cross is not a Christian theology. Today we're going to look at the problem of the cross, we're going to look at the focus of the cross and we're going to look at the betrayal of the cross. First of all, the problem of the cross, there really is a problem with the cross over and over again. We see that problem. What do we call the day? We call it Good Friday. And we know why we call it Good Friday because we're after the cross and we look back at the cross and we look back at the resurrection and so we're able to say that on the cross our sins were forgiven and so it is a Good Friday. But when Jesus died on the cross in that day and time, it was anything but good. And then there's another problem with the cross, and that is the whole idea of crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. The leader even says, but I want to free him. No, crucify him. And here are the people who one week before praised Jesus on Palm Sunday, and today is what we consider to be Palm Sunday. And they praised Jesus on Palm Sunday, but a week later, They are ready to put Jesus on the cross and they are saying, crucify him, crucify him. Our scripture text this morning, Luke the 23rd chapter, if you'll turn there, Luke 23. Luke 23 starting with verse 12. That day Herod and Pilate became friends. Before this, they had been enemies. There's a problem. Problem two men who were enemies and they became friends. Friends in their opposition against Jesus. Listen, take note of that, would you? Anytime people gather together in opposition of Jesus, you've got a problem. In verse 13, Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, and said to them, You brought me this man as one who was inciting the people to rebellion. I have examined him in in your presence and have found no basis for your charges against him. Neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us. As you can see, he has done nothing to deserve death. Therefore, I will punish him and then release him. But the whole crowd shouted, Away with this man! Release Barabbas to us! Barabbas had been thrown into prison for an insurrection in the city and for murder. He was a murderer. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them, but they kept shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! And here we see this crowd that is crying out over and over again, even to the opposition of Pilate, crucify him, crucify him. And where are the disciples? The disciples are nowhere to be found. They are long gone. And the world turns against Jesus. And when the world turns against Jesus, the world turns against God. Now we read the scripture. We know from the scripture that They like the good deeds of Jesus. They like the good words of Jesus. They may have even liked the love, the mercy, and the grace. But we can't forget that then there is the cross. Paul put it this way in Ephesians, the second chapter, verse 4. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ Even when we were dead in our sins, it is by grace that you have been saved. And just a few moments ago, we took the Lord's Supper. We took the communion. 
And we can't forget when we take the Lord's Supper and we take the communion, this is His body broken for you. This is His blood shed for you. Jockey Robinson was one of the greatest baseball players in all of history. He was the first African-American baseball player to hit the major leagues. He played for the Brooklyn Dodgers. One time, Jackie Robinson, that great baseball player, committed an error in the field. And when he did, unfortunately, the crowd turned against him. They began to shout all kinds of racial slurs to him. In his friend, baseball player Pee Wee Reese. Pee Wee Reese came up to Jackie Robinson, put his arm around him, and stared up at the crowd in opposition as to say, This is my friend. I wonder sometimes if when we get to heaven, the crowds will be there. And someone might just say, why is he here? Why is she here? They committed error after error after error. But Jesus is there. And Jesus puts his arm around us. And he says, this is my friend. Welcome. Welcome home. And then the focus of the cross The focus of the cross has never changed. It will never change. It will always be the same. The focus of the cross is God's redemption plan. The heart of salvation is the cross. And the Bible says we preach Christ and Him crucified. That Friday was a long, hard day. It actually started... The night before, it was one event after another, was the meal in the upper room, Luke 22. We considered that meal last week, and Jesus and his men went to a secluded place on the Mount of Olives, and Jesus prayed late into the night, but his disciples could not stay awake, and they went to sleep, and then early in the morning... The disciples are awakened to shouts and the clanging of steel, of swords and of shields. Is it a dream? No, it's not a dream. It's more like a nightmare. And then the next few hours sweep by so rapidly and the soldiers arrested Jesus and they hauled him before the Jewish high priest. And the scripture says, I want you to notice this, before the sun was up, Early in the morning, they had gathered together and they had called a meeting of the Jewish high council to interrogate Jesus. And the witnesses said they heard Jesus blaspheme the name of God in the holy temple. In fact, they said, we heard him say that he would destroy the temple and he would rebuild it in three days, all of the charges were lies and they were bribed and there was a secret trial a process that was illegal from start to finish but Jesus never protested he didn't strike back he didn't talk back look at that scripture text would you in Luke 23 starting with the verse 35 the people stood watching now notice that the people just stand there watching they don't do anything they just stand there watching and the rulers even sneered at him they said he saved others let him save himself if he is God's Messiah the chosen one the soldiers also came up and mocked him they offered him wine vinegar and said if you are the king of the Jews save yourselves there was a written notice above him which said Jesus is the king of the Jews One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourselves and us. And we can't forget verse 31 of that text. It's a key verse. It says, for if people do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? In other words, if they are willing to put Jesus on the cross... 
when he is alive, how much worse will it be for his followers once Jesus is dead? Listen, every one of us must come to the place that we're willing to count the cost of the cross. The cross is serious business. And the cross is indeed costly. Paul said in Galatians 2 verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Listen this morning. If you haven't counted the cost of the cross this day, is the day for you to make your decision and your commitment to follow Christ. This is the day for you to stand up and say, I'm going to be a Christian. I'm going to be a Christ follower. I am so thankful that Jesus was willing to die on the cross. Here's how you do that. A, accept the fact that you are a sinner. All of us know without question that we are sinners. And we fall short of the glory of God. But it was through the cross that God forgave our sins through Jesus. B. Believe. Believe with all of your heart that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, your personal Lord and Savior. And believe with everything you've got that Jesus died so that you could have salvation. Jesus wants above all else for you to live with him for all of eternity. And if you were the only sinner on the face of the earth, I happen to believe that Jesus would have died for you on the cross. You're that important to him. And see, confess his name before men. I am a follower of the one Jesus who died on the cross for my sins. And he invites you. To be a follower of God. Follower of Jesus. Realizing that Jesus died on the cross for your sin. And later in our service, we'll have an invitation time where you can make that kind of decision to accept Jesus. If you've never accepted him as your Lord and Savior, this is the day for you to follow Christ. And then number three, the betrayal of the cross. Jesus fulfilled an important passage of Scripture. The prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah 53, verse 7, He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. How important is that passage of Scripture by Isaiah so many years ago? I'll tell you how important it is. After the death of Jesus... After the resurrection of Jesus, the Christ followers get together and they begin to preach the gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in the book of Acts, the 8th chapter, there is an Ethiopian preacher who is preaching the gospel. And do you know what message he shared? He shared that message there in Isaiah 53. Three, he wanted people to know that the cross was the central act of betrayal in all of history. Remember that. The cross is the central act of betrayal in all of history. And even as I preach today, I bet some of you have been there. The day starts off good, really good. You have the activities of the day all planned, the activities start, but then by nightfall all kinds of chaos breaks loose. Everything seems to go wrong. The whole world seems to be against you. You are lied to. You are lied about. It may happen at work. It may happen at home. Hopefully it doesn't happen at the church. But you get the blame. The fact that you tried to do right doesn't really seem to matter very much. Somebody still accused you. And you know how it hurts. How much it hurts to be, to have the betrayal of a friend, a friend who turns on you, refusing to help when you need it, 
Maybe it was worse. Maybe you heard the gossip and you heard the rumors come from the lips of somebody that you trusted and somebody that you love. Betrayal always hurts. I want you to remember something this morning. Whatever betrayal you face in life, that is nothing compared to the betrayal in the abandonment of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you do feel betrayal, and you will feel betrayal and abandonment, you know, always know, that you have a friend in Jesus. And Jesus is always that friend that sticks closer than a brother. Acts the third chapter, verse 13 says, The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed. You disowned him before Pilate. Though he had decided to let him go, you disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life. But God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses to this by faith in the name of Jesus. This man whom you see and know was made strong. Jesus was arrested at Gethsemane because of a friend for 30 pieces of silver. The price of a common slave. Judas turns against Jesus he stepped out of the crowd, pretending to greet Jesus as a friend. He gave him a hug. He kissed him on the cheek. And the very act of, re of friendship turned into an act of treachery for Jesus. And then the other friends, they defected and they deserted him. The first sign of trouble and even Peter, who said, I will follow you even if it means death denied him three times and on that Friday you remember Jesus stood alone he stood falsely accused betrayed abandoned and the whole message is a message of betrayal and everything moves so quickly the soldiers mocked him they roughed him up for sport they press against him and make a makeshift crown of thorns on his head. The blood flows down his brow. They laughed. They paraded him before Pilate's palace in a purple robe. And they shout out, some king you are. And then we can't forget the Roman cat of nine tails was a long leathered whip. Multiple ends were embedded with nails and pieces of bone and glass. And he received 39 lashes from the soldiers laid on the back of Jesus and flesh turned into raw meat. And the pain was unimaginable. It probably seemed like it would never end. Our scripture text, Luke 23 in verse 32, two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. And when they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. People stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. And the soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which said, this is the king of the Jews. And one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourselves and us too. And according to Jesus, not in the book of Luke, but instead in the passage in Matthew 27, 
makes it clear that even the Father forsook Jesus. And Jesus himself said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, it simply says, He gave up the Spirit. It was gone. From beginning to end, the message of the cross was betrayal. Don't forget that. And we need to seriously answer the question this morning. What do you make of the cross? You see, it's in that betrayal that we understand that the cross is the divine intersection between God's love and our betrayal. And Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Many years ago, Mel Gibson filmed the movie, The Passion of Christ. If you have never seen that movie, and some of you have not, I know, if you have never seen that movie, I would highly recommend that you take the time to see the movie at least once. You may only want to see it once after you see it. But I would highly recommend that you see that movie, The Passion of Christ. And when that movie came out in the first place, it was under attack. Critics objected to the violence and they objected to the blood. And most didn't understand the reality of what was happening. Crucifixion wasn't just an execution. Crucifixion was a public torture. And at 9 o'clock that Friday morning, the soldiers spread eagle Jesus against a pole they tied him to a piece of wood. They drove iron spikes through his hands and his feet. They lifted up the beam. They dropped it in a hole. Six hours, six long, hot hours, Jesus hung there, suspended between heaven and earth, dying minute by moment, hour by hour, and even when he died, the soldiers continued their taunts and the crowds jeered. His mother and friends stood back in horror. Their hearts were broken. And at noon on Friday, the sky over Jerusalem turned strangely dark. The Bible says that the earth shook and the thief on the cross next to Jesus cried out, Remember me, remember me this day in paradise and the soldiers offered Jesus a drink mixed with painkiller he declines it and Jesus cried out my God my God why have you forsaken me when Mel Gibson filmed the last 12 hours of Jesus's life the passion of Christ he wanted the message to come through loud and clear he wanted people to know that it was the viewers of the movie who put Jesus on the cross. And those people were responsible for Christ's death. Mel Gibson is a veteran Hollywood star. If you know anything about Mel Gibson's life, you know, of course, that he is a sinner, just like all of us. But as the director and the producer of that movie he could have given himself any part in the film instead his face never appears on screen but strangely enough his hands appear in the movie only once they are the hands the ones holding the spike and holding the hammer, nailing Jesus to the cross. The Bible explains it this way. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. 
And Jesus experienced separation from the Heavenly Father. And when He experienced that separation, He knew. No one else knew. This execution was more than just at the hands of wicked men, but it was according to the plan of heaven itself. He was innocent. No one else was. It was not for his sins that he died on the cross. It was for our sins. And Paul said in 1 Corinthians, for the message of the cross is foolishness of those who are perishing but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God unto salvation. In the day ended in death. And the disciples were distraught. They were dejected. They were grief stricken. Anyone who has buried a loved one or a friend knows the feeling of standing beside the grave. It's like time stands still. It seems like a bad dream. You think it will probably go away, and then the next day you realize it doesn't go away. Instead, it's very real. And you know better than anybody else that death and the grave cast a shadow over everything else you've been there. And I think that's why Paul reminded us in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, Verse 55, death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. This morning, the victory of the cross is in the resurrection, and we know that. And next Sunday, we celebrate Easter, and we're going to celebrate the resurrection. That's the message of Jesus. It's the message that he overcame death he went through death so that our sins could be forgiven. And we simply say, thank you, Jesus. Would you pray with me? Oh, Lord God, how we thank you for Jesus and the divine sacrifice that he made on our behalf to die on the cross so that our sins could be forgiven. And how glorious it is that our sins, which are many, can we be washed and we can be as clean, white as snow, O oh Lord. You have forgiven us. You have washed away our sin. O oh God, this day we commit to you. We come to this time of invitation. It's a time to commit. It's time to give your heart to Jesus. For the first time, you come to Jesus, say, Lord, I want to follow you. I want to live for you. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you, Jesus, that you've done so much for me. You come, give it to Jesus. If you're here today, you need to make a decision for Christ, whatever it might be, a church home. What a great church this is. You come. Make that decision for Jesus that New Hope's going to be your church home. You're going to worship. You're going to serve here. You're going to make a difference in this community. I'm so thankful, Lord, for the words that I hear of people in our congregation who are making a difference in this community. That's what we want to do is make a difference. Thank you so much, oh God, for Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Let's stand. Let's sing. You've got a decision to make. Listen, don't put it off. You come make your decision for Jesus today.